thought about the other day about being able to come here and to speak and to share in contemporary worship. A lot of you, because of the, the way that we've been in this church the last several years, can understand, I, I have done contemporary worship years ago in the church I was at before I came here. And I love contemporary worship, and I'm so glad and honored that in the six years that I've been here, um, and I don't want to go into a lot of names, but there are some people that I will probably never get to thank, and I want to thank them for their dedication to this service and to this ministry of First Methodist Church. But I especially want to thank Jack Noel and Debbie Conway and their commitment and there are hundreds of others of you, all of you, have been a part of this. But when I came here six years ago, Jack and Debbie and I spent a lot of time working with this, battling and going back and forth and things we liked and let together and things we didn't like about each other. But, uh, <laughs> but the truth is, folks, they've done an awesome job, and you ought to thank them for the work and the commitment they've made for it. Um, The connection is a vital part of First Methodist Church, and uh, my prayers and blessings go with you in the future of your church and of our church, because we're all United Methodists, and we're all connected. And that being said, I want to share something else with you this morning before I begin, and that is that one of the other things that has happened over the time that we've been together is, is that we've had several staff changes, and we've adjusted some responsibilities in staff. And one of the things that we did that I want to just acknowledge that I think was one of the greatest things that we did was is we took Clint Ware and we took him out of adult ministries. <laughs> and we put him in charge of missions. And Clint Ware has done an awesome job in the area of missions in our local church. So before Clint leaves, I hope you'll thank him for the work he's done in missions to bring about the mission outreach of this church and to continue to help it to grow. And folks, don't ever let it die because when missions dies, so does your church. Amen? And I'm standing here with a mission in my hand. And that is that a part of one of the things Clint has done is he's gone beyond the local church. He's gone to the annual conference to help uh, support missions throughout the state of Mississippi and around the world. And one of the ways that we can do that is coming up starting in May, there's going to be an opportunity for you to uh, make bids on uh, silent auction items that will go at the, and be at the annual conference. And to close the annual conference, the, whoever wins those bids will get the gifts that are there. Our church is uh, putting together three baskets, one for Mississippi State, one for... Uh, Southern Miss, one for Ole Miss, and then a cooking basket also. Uh, so this morning I was given this as a part to go in the Ole Miss basket, okay? Um, it's really hard for me to stand here and hold this, <laughs> and I am so glad there's no camera flash going off because I'm assuming that means nobody's taking a picture. Uh, but uh, this will obviously get attention for some. But if you have a gift you'd like to present to the basket and help fill those baskets, uh, it would just be awesome if you would do that and get that done. And, and then when it comes time to bid on them, if you would bid on them, um, if you want to take a look at some of them, uh, there's a ch uh, church in Jackson that has already brought their baskets, and they have put together a Jackson State and an Alcorn State basket. And, uh, boy, they are just fantastic. I was impressed with what was in there. And it uh, looks really great. So I'm, I'm assuming Clint's going to get some help fixing our baskets up to make them look good anyway. Uh, right now they're just kind of spread out. But he's got a lot of neat stuff in there. And if you got stuff, and it, and it needs to be new, okay, don't bring your old umbrellas or whatever. Uh, bring something nice and incredible to that. It would be a great way to help support missions and the mission outreach of churches in the Mississippi Annual Conference as we minister to both local and people beyond our doors and um, I think you know as I said missions is a vital part of who we are today I want to share something and I want to share some stuff that uh, sometimes makes some of us a little uncomfortable and the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to actually read some some scripture and uh, I want to read from the book of Revelation um, it's on the screen I hope you can read it it's probably it may not be large enough but 
It's Revelation chapter 5, verses 11 through 14. And uh, I invite you to hear the word of our Lord. Then I looked, and I heard the sound of many angels surrounding the throne, the living creatures and the elders. They numbered in the millions, thousands upon thousands. They said in a loud voice, Worthy is the slaughtered lamb to receive power, wealth, wisdom, and might, and honor, glory, and blessing." And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea. I heard everything everywhere say, Blessing, honor, glory, and power belong to the one seated on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Then the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. Thanks be to God for the reading and the hearing of our lesson for today. Would you pray with me, please? Now, dear gracious Heavenly Father, may the words of our mouth, the thoughts in our minds, and uh, our presence and being be with you now as we share in worship and we hear your word. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. When a Sunday comes along and the preacher takes the book of the Revelation and looks at it and begins to think about preaching from the book of Revelation, most of us, and I'm talking about preacher kind, sometimes tend to kind of fade away from that text. We might want to look more at a gospel lesson or an epistle lesson or maybe even go to an Old Testament and, and, and get away from the, even the stories and, and even possibly speak from one of the prophets. I mean, honestly, I'd rather speak from the prophet Isaiah than I had the book of Revelation. And most preachers feel that way. And you have to understand, Isaiah is my least favorite prophet in all of Scripture. Okay? I think you've heard me say that before. That doesn't mean Isaiah's not a great book or wonderful for us to uh, learn from. But when we talk about the Revelation, sometimes we even get fearful that we might even speak about what's in the Revelation. And so, historically, there have been Preachers and people have faded away from looking at the Revelation. And some of it has been because there have been some questions about its authenticity in the first place. And uh, the truthfulness of it. And part of what gets us in in that is, is when we start looking at what's in that book. In the first four chapters, we discover sayings to the seven churches. If you really read those statements to the seven churches, it'll almost scare you, especially if you place yourself in an imaginary stance of being in one of those churches. Maybe your own guilt feeling or question of where do I fit in there. But when we look at Revelation, there's a question that I think might serve us all. I have a question here that I'd like to, 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 to show you and to ask you. Does a book full of strange creatures and a punitive God really matter in our life today? Does does the book of Revelation really matter in our world? When we begin to think about that and to look at it, we look and say, well, you know, we've got enough to deal with already in our world. I mean, things like this. We've got to get the kids dressed for school. Okay? So we got to look and say, okay, have they got their shirt and their shoes and their socks and their underwear and all that kind of stuff? Are they ready to go? Man, we're so busy having to do that, we don't have time to read the book of Revelation. Or we look and we say, uh, you know, uh, have I got enough money to take care of all the things that are going on in the world today? I need to work harder. I need to come up with more money. I need to figure out a way that I can do this based on money to pay the bills. Or we might even say, you know, I'm so busy that uh, I have to take care of my elderly parents. 
I ain't got time to really research and to study into the book of Revelation. I got to take care of these old folks. Well, yeah, we do. Or perhaps we might come along and say, you know, I'm so busy. I got to get my 30 minutes worth of exercise today. Chubb, I'm so glad you noticed I lost some weight. Man, I'm just so excited. It's all that exercise I've been doing, which means I've been getting up and down more regularly, not walking or running more regularly, uh, and I've been watching my diet more than anything. You know, we, we have busy schedules. We, we schedule our lives, and we've got so much going on that sometimes we wonder if there's even enough time for us to spend an hour or maybe two at church on Sunday morning. And let's, let's face it, and we know this, you know this. The reality is, a lot of times we wake up on Sunday morning and say, you know, I really need to do this. I really need to do that. And we find excuses for not to be here. Um, we all do it. And I wonder sometimes if, if there's enough in the book of Revelation for me to keep your attention for 15 or 20 minutes. I hope I can. I hope over the next 15, 20 minutes there's enough here that that I can share with you that says, hey, this is important for us to look at. Because in the book of Revelation, we have to understand that there's something built into that revelation for all of the people. And that is a hopefulness. So this morning, I want to give you a couple of things for us to try to look at as far as the book of Revelation goes. The first thing that I want us to see is that um, Revelation provides us an antidote. And now y'all can read this. Revelation provides us an antidote for the consumeristic culture we live in today that wants us to stay perpetually young, consume more, and fall into deeper debt without considering the generational effects of living a life that's all about me. 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 Because that's what our world wants us to do. It wants us to live in the me world. And reading through the book of Revelation, it's as if we're seeing through time. Another time. If we're looking at life from another time in and of itself. But when you look at the book of Revelation, it's like looking at stars. You see, stars, I'm told, are lights from the past. That that light has probably already diminished from the time it left its presence till the time we receive it. It no longer exists, except in our being able to see the stars. And so in reading the stars, as we look at that, we begin to understand that the people in the early church... The Christians that were a part of the way were struggling and struggled in what was going on in their world. They were struggling because they faced the possibilities of a society in which they live. You see, we face issues in our own society, but they faced an issue and lived in a world in which you were either rich or you either lived in the, the realm of the poor. There was no middle class in the time of the book of the writing of the Revelation when John wrote from the Isle of Patmos. There were those that had plenty and there were those who had none. And if you were on this side that had none, you were the the, the sufferers. You were under persecution in many, many different ways. And there was all kinds of things that that you had to depend upon. They depended on you to take care of the, the hard labor of the land. They depended on you to take care of building their buildings and they depended on on you, the poor, to to provide all their needs and yet they didn't provide you with very much, if any. And then on the same turn, what they expected out of you was they expected you to um, bow down to their gods. Maybe even bow down to the emperor as your god. Think about that. How would it feel to bow down to the president as the God of our life? I'm not just talking about this president. I'm talking about any president we've ever had. How would you really feel about that? 
that's the kind of life and the situation that they were in during the time of the writing of the book of the Revelation. That people were faced with that. In the context of such that they were faced with, the Revelation was written to offer to people hope. Hope. Now, when you read the book of the Revelation, you're going to find all kinds of creatures and the punitive type God that I mentioned earlier. Punishment and all those kinds of things. And wild and strange looking creatures. And you have a hard time picturing that as I would have a hard time picturing that. Other than we go online and we look and see how somebody else has interpreted what this looks like. And our imagination builds the creature. In their time, it would have been easier because they didn't have the the technology that we have. It would have been easier for them to associate because the stories would have been told about such creatures over and over again. And as those stories were told, they became uh, uh, a a life-living example for them. It's kind of like if we were to show them a, a, a tennis shoe with a swoosh on the side of it. They wouldn't understand that. We understand that as a a mean for uh, uh, perseverance or encouragement. But they wouldn't have been able to see that. We have difficulty looking and seeing some of the things they saw. They would have the same trouble in our world today seeing the things that we saw. And we have trouble even hearing the words in Scriptures when it says millions and thousands upon thousands. One text says myriads and myriads. Another says millions and millions and thousands and thousands. One writer I read said 200 million and thousands and thousands. How many would that be? You know? All we know is it, it, it shows and, and it's, it, it gives us the idea that there are lots and lots of us who need to know the saving grace of Christ. Thousands. And we need to know that there's hope. We're not any different from that generation to this generation of a people who need hope. Probably the biggest difference that we might see is is that during the time of the Roman Empire, church was a matter of life and death. If you went to church, the probability of your death was great. If you didn't go to church and you celebrated the Roman Empire, the probability of your life was great. Today, we live in a society that it's polite to come to church. Nobody gets on to you for coming to church, do they? I didn't hear an answer. Does anybody get on to you for coming to church? No. They really don't, do they? Somebody says, I'm going to church. They wave at you and say, goodbye, have a good time. You say, come go to church with me. And they say, no, I don't feel like going today. What do we say? That's all right, I'm going to church. We don't condemn them for not going. They don't condemn us for going. I dare say that any one of you is going to be crucified this afternoon because you came to church this morning. You think? I think not. And yet it hasn't always been that way. You see, there have been those who have gone through um, persecution because they claim a faith in Christ. Hierapolis uh, was torn apart by horses. Ignatius of um, Antioch was sentenced to be eaten by lions. Lawrence was grilled alive. Bartholomew, I love this. Not that I really like it. Anybody know how Bartholomew was killed? Because of his faith? He was skinned alive. That hurts the hair on my arm just thinking about it. Over the centuries, however, martyrs have taken on a almost a uh, an iconic type thing. 
Many have been referred to as relics. And, uh, and, and things have uh, been made that, that honor them because of their faithfulness. Um, and as a result, um, people in the 9th or the 12th or the 6th century um, were recognized because of their personal situation, because of their faith. And they were honored in such a way. Here's another value of revelation that, that we can find. It says, Revelation lets us look backward into our historical chronos, our sequential time, and it allows us to look forward into another historical or kairos time or opportune time. Now, with that statement in mind, what Revelation is announcing to us is, is that in the midst of the, the chronos world in which we live, we live in a world that announces our baptismal vows. We live in a world that is uh, based upon the powers of this world. We live in a world that, that uh, gives us uh, how we should live based upon what has happened in our past. But we also live in a historical world that looks at the chronos, or the, I mean the, the kairos, or an opportunity that awaits us. An opportunity that there is more to life than what we are living in this world today. And that what has happened is not what is and it's not what necessarily will be. That there is uh, uh, no beginning, no middle, and no end. That there is an opportune time coming in the kingdom of God for us. And it's in this hope that we as Christians understand the reality that is anticipated that we will have that allows us as Christians and those who have been Christians throughout life and throughout our history to understand that a part of what we do is is that we share for justice and love and peace for all God's children. And we know that somewhere along the line, That when we stand up for Christ, that no matter what happens, we will see His glory. No matter when the end time may be. It's in that hope that we have. How many of you have seen the movie, The The Best Exotic Marigold Hotel? Anybody seen that movie yet? Do you like it? It seems pretty interesting. I've not actually seen the whole movie. I watched the clip of it the other day. And uh, this line came out of the movie. I want to show you this. Watch this real quick. I want to stay at the other hotel, the one that's in the brochure. In India, we have a saying, everything will be all right in the end. So if it is not all right, it is not yet the end. Did y'all get it? Here's, Here's the statement. Everything will be all right in the end. If it's not all right, then it's not yet the end. I love that statement. Because sometimes what happens is is we think the end is coming, the world is coming to an end. And it may be. But if, if it's not right, the end's not here yet. The end's not here yet. 2,000 years of time have passed since the writing of the Revelation. And we still live in a world that has a need for hope. We still live lives that have lives filled with hope. We have all kind of current Bible studies. And those Bible studies are awesome. The Bible studies help us to grow in our Christian faith. They help us to understand God's Word. They help us to understand how we might live. They help us to see that miracles still happen. If you don't believe miracles still happen, come spend some time with me somewhere along the way because I'll show you some miracles. Matter of fact, I wrote someone this week and told them I wanted to thank them for letting me be a part of the miracle that has happened in their life. Did I perform the miracle? No, I didn't perform the miracle. I'm not a miracle worker. But did I see God perform a miracle in their life? Yes, I did. I'm blessed that that I've seen many of those, and I know that God still performs miracles. And there's hope in that, knowing that God still performs miracles. 
Because we live in a world in which there's an economic crisis. We're aware that that, that economic crisis hurts us uh, individually and corporately. We live in a world that's faced with um, religious uh, fanaticals that will do all kinds of crazy things in the name of religion. I don't have to name them. I think you know those. We live in a world where there are dictators that think they can control the world by putting a nuclear bomb on the end of a missile. And they think that's hope. That's not hope. Hope's found in in finding the peace. The peace that passes all understanding. But just like the saints of the book of the Revelation, we need to know that in Christ, as he prayed, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. You see, we believe in a God that gives us our daily bread. We believe in a God that forgives us of our sins. We believe in a God that Uh, gives us strength to get through day to day. We believe in a God that gives us the power to face the temptations that are out there. We believe in a God that can deliver us from all evil. We believe in a God that is trustworthy and true. And just like the four creatures, we can say amen. See, at the end of this text that I read to you, the four creatures heard what had been said And the four creatures said, Amen. Amen's been translated from Hebrew to Greek to Latin to English. And it means something like believe or faithful. What it really comes down to say is sure. Amen is a a way of saying truly. We believe. So if anything, the value of the book of Revelation reminds us that we're not the first and we're not going to be the last that doesn't understand the writing of the book of Revelation. We're not the first, we're not going to be the last that doesn't understand what's there. But we are with an understanding that Revelation reminds us that our human condition is a temporary condition and that there is a greater place for us. And even though we may not understand the end of time or the the prophetic words of the writer of the book of the Revelation, we may not understand the creatures, we may not understand the the, the God of, of the book of Revelation and what's shared there, how the punitive penalties come upon the people. And although we may not understand all of that, what we do know is, is we have hope. And that hope is built. In Jesus Christ. You see, you may not understand all of that. They probably understood it better than we do, but we have hope. A fellow by the name of Leonard Sweet has um, put together a a little piece that he answers a question. What breaks your heart? Well, let me share with you this little video clip real quick of what he says and what breaks my heart. What breaks your heart? I, I, uh, the way in which we, both conservatives and liberals, everybody, evangelicals, mainliners, oldliners, sideliners, offliners, soon-to-be flatliners, um, are losing focus on Christ. Um, We got everything else. We got principles, propositions of the right. We got principles, propositions of the left. And um, Jesus is missing. And I'm missing Jesus uh, in our church. Um, This is a culture that you expect to miss Jesus in the culture, but you don't expect not to have Jesus lifted up in the church. And we're about everything else. We're about justice, we're about uh, causes, we're about these biblical principles. We've become about everything other other than Christ. 
And I, it, it all came to a head to me, and I'm not going to name who this person was, but we were on a panel together. And I'm talking about what, you know, this focus that's got to be on this lifting up Christ. You said, if I be lifted up, I will draw. We were trying to do the, we're drawing boards, trying to drop this strategy, drop that strategy. He's the draw. We're to lift him up, and he does the drawing. Not me. Um, he's the draw. So it's not come to church, it's come to Christ. I'm, I'm trying to focus on this. And, and he goes, well, for me, it's come to the Bible. And I'm going, well, but, but the Bible points us to Christ. And he goes, well, you know, but for me, it's all about the church is not saying come to the Bible. And um, finally, I said, you know, I think there's some people who think eternity is going to be like this million year, first million years we're going to spend doing a Bible study. And he looked, and, and you'd know this name, so I'm not telling you. Well, I fully expect the first 50,000 to 100,000 years to be doing a Bible study. Absolutely. So I can get right, but I didn't get right here. I'm gone. But you got Jesus. You got Jesus. To understand heaven is a Bible study when you have Jesus. And I, I resisted. I mean, I so wanted John 5, where Jesus himself is talking about the Pharisees, going, you think that by the scriptures you have life, but the scriptures point to me. I'm quoting here now, church. I'm quoting Jesus. The scriptures point to me. It is from me that you have life. And there's nothing more breaks my heart than that. In Him is life. He is the bread of life. And uh, we feast on Him in our hearts in Thanksgiving. Um, the Bible points to Him. I, I marinate my mind and soak my spirit in the Word every day, but it points me to Him, to that life in Him. What gives you hope? That God will not be without a witness. And I'm not optimistic, but I am hopeful. And that Jesus is found in this future. He's not so much pushing me from behind and us. He's pulling us from the future towards him. And if we, the church, decide to have our own mission other than God's mission, God will still be there. God will raise up pagan Persian King Cyruses, use prostitutes like Rahab, use all sorts of surprising people, um, because God will be there. And I want to be there where God is. And I challenge you uh, around those two words, be there. Put on the character of Christ and live the context of your culture. Be there. What's the value? What's the value of the book of the Revelation? The value of the book of the Revelation is that it too leads us to Christ. And our hope is found in Christ, who will be there. My question for you is, will you be there? Will you be there with Christ? Will you be there with the one who doesn't have Christ, that they might find Christ? Be there. Let us pray. Surely, truly, Lord, in you, we find Christ. Amen.